The Myth of Jesus with David Fitzgerald. My name is Daniel Sanderson, and welcome back to The Myth of Jesus with David Fitzgerald. We have, of course, David Fitzgerald, along with Scott Heffler, and special guest, biblical scholar, Russell Gemerkin. To give a little structure to tonight's uh, discussion, we will first talk about the Elephantine papyri, and then we'll move to the Greek sources in the Hebrew Bible. Then around the midpoint in the discussion, we'll talk about the Hecateus of Abdera, I hope I'm saying that correctly, and mm -hmm. Moses. Finally, for the last quarter of the episode, we're actually going to just have a discussion. So yep. we're glad that you could join us now. And uh, Russell, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work on the Elephantine papyri? Well, I've written about them a couple times, uh, just incidentally in some of my other books. Um, the thing is about the elephant, ele Elephantine papyri, they were written around 450 to 400 BC. Uh, they were found um, at the site of Elephantine, which is at the first cataract of the Nile in Egypt, very dry climate. So all these documents written in Aramaic are amazingly preserved and they're contemporary evidence. They are not, there's no speculation as to the date because most of these texts are dated in terms of the reign of Darius or whatever. So uh, we know when these texts were written, uh, the contemporary, and they were written by a Jewish military colony, members of a Jewish military colony at Elephantine. And they provide a snapshot of what Judaism was actually like at that point in time. Not speculative, it's real evidence. Yeah. Uh, that contrasts with um, what I call the ancient Near Eastern paradigm of biblical studies. The documentary hypothesis was a major expression of that, that said that the Hebrew Bible or the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, is an ancient Near Eastern set of texts uh, written during the monarchy and the Babylonian period and, uh, you know, the exile and Persian period and the Pentateuch and many of the other texts, according to that paradigm, they were finished, they were completed uh, by about 450 BC. They were written from, say, 900 BC to 450 BC. Everyone agreed on that from, say, 1800 down to uh, 1993. <laughs> uh, everyone agreed on that chronological framework. So, these biblical texts were all interpreted as uh, really old, ancient, and, and it was all speculative. There are no biblical texts that are that old. Yeah. Uh, it's a hypothetical framework. So in the 1900s, the Elephantine papyri were discovered, uh, and also Astraca, which are written on pottery shirts, that has all this evidence from uh, from about 400 BC, after the Book of Moses were supposedly completed. Well, these papyri don't know anything about any biblical writings. They don't know about Moses. They don't know about Abraham, David, Aaron, any of the patriarchs. Um, they There's no reference to Mosaic law. They had their own temple at Elephantine, um, their own temple of Yah, and also Aeneas Bethel and a few other gods were also wor worshipped there. They were polytheistic. Um, and so around 400 BC, the temple was destroyed by some angry Egyptians. Um, and so the priests of Elephantine wrote Jerusalem to the high priest there and his brothers, the other priests um, and other officials asking for permission to rebuild their second temple. Uh, 
And evidently, the people in Jerusalem, Jonathan, the high priest and others, said, sure, fine, why not? No problem. Russell, let me jump in for just a moment yeah. here. Just because what you've said is mind blowing to me um, that you've got a, a temple besides the temple in Jerusalem at a time yeah. when there is supposed to be nothing but the one temple. I mean, major portions of the Old Testament insist nope, nope, there's just one temple, yeah. no high places, no Asherah, no uh, stone, standing stones, only the one temple. And yet these guys in this mercenary colony in Egypt, not only have their own temple, but there's at least three gods worship there, and they're on great terms with the Jerusalem yeah. temple. Yeah. yeah, perfectly. Yeah, they're not heretics. They're not some kind of weird fringe oh. group. Um, they are just ordinary Jews. And um, the span of the letters from Elephantine, is it at least 50 years or is it almost 100 years? It's it, it, um, There's a whole... There's the majority of them of, are between about 450 BC, yeah, and about 400 BC, yeah, maybe 404 BC. There are actually a few that are later in Greek, and I mean, you know, there's stragglers here and there. But it's uh, amazing. I, I, I have a quick question. Um, yeah. Why would we expect that a sex writings should have a summary of the whole tradition and mention all the main figures? Oh, it's not that. It's that they seem to lack complete. There's no, like, for instance, no one's named after any of the characters in no. the Old Testament. They don't show any knowledge of that at all. Their Passover seems to be a harvest festival. And we'll, yeah. Russell, jump in here. That, that's a very uh, critical one. There's the so-called Passover letter. It actually only mentions the Days of Unleavened Bread, which are the seven days after Passover. Uh, and it gives instructions. Uh, to the Jews of Elephantine on how to observe it, and it's it's the right day, uh, it's the right week, you know, from like the fifteenth to the twenty second or so, and they talked about putting out unleavened bread, all of those aspects. Um, so they they tell them how to observe the days of unleavened bread, the Passover season. And it's but a little weird don't... that in the fifth century BC they have to be explaining this as though it's not totally known from ancient times um yeah there's there's a theory that maybe there was um uh, 13 months in that year so um, mm, mm. Uh, they might have been mainly interested in in uh you know which month to observe it in yeah that's that's one theory put out recently by Idan Dershowitz I think but so they give the complete instructions on how to observe the Passover. And Scott, they leave out Moses. They leave out the Exodus. They leave out the cedar uh, meal of Passover. All of that's gone. What they're concerned with is um, no beer because that has leaven in it. Um, <laughs> which is well, is it possible that what we call the canonical stuff was so well known that they didn't bother repeating it and that their texts were their texts? And were interesting for them because they were novel and additions instead of just being copyists of old stuff? Well, there's not a hint of, of any sort of uh, biblical writings. Um, furthermore, uh, let's take the Sabbath. They have a seven day week in Elephantine because there are references to the seventh day. In one particular um, text, the uh, owner of a, of a boat that's shipping vegetables tells his employee, the vegetables are coming on Saturday. You unload them or I will murder you. You're a dead man if you don't take those vegetables off. So oh, I see. So core traditions are missing. Or, or core, actually, in this case, a core tradition is positively violated. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And... Um, and when they when they um, write uh, about Passover, they don't say that their authority is not, um, uh, you know, read an Exodus, mm -hmm. you know, twenty two or whatever it is. There's there's no reference to authoritative writings anywhere, uh, or Mosaic law. It's uh, they can, when they consult with Jerusalem, that's what you call oral oral Torah. 
uh, Wellhausen said that before there was a written Torah, before there were the laws of Moses, there was oral Torah, which is you ask the priest and he'd tell you what the proper practices were. So at Alphantine, you still have oral Torah. Um, and, you know, they, and they're polytheists, they have their own temple. They're, they're, the fact they, that there's they, at least three gods worshipped in the temple, oh, and they're and yeah. totally fine on good terms with the Jerusalem temple, that still blows yeah. my mind. Yeah. Still blows I, my think, mind. I think there's five uh, different gods in the mm. temple. Uh, and when they took up a collection to rebuild the temple, um, there were, you know, pagans were involved too, people with uh, names that showed that they were polytheists. Babylonia, the same thing's going on. Uh, there's lots of evidence from the name, uh, names in certain cuneiform uh, tablets from the city of the Jews that uh, so they were polytheists too. And no, there's just no evidence of monotheism or, or monolatry where you just worship Yahweh. Right. Um, quite the contrary. There's also another temple of Yah in, um, in uh, Edom as well, hmm. uh, an obscure text that refers to that, not in the Elephantine papyri, but elsewhere. So you have a snapshot of what Judaism was actually like during the Persian period when um, the Pentateuch and Mosaic laws were supposed to be absolutely authoritative. Well, they don't, they don't even exist. There's a book by um, Granarod recently that uh, he refers to it amusingly as uh, the elephant in the in the room. Uh, you know, there's this evidence that uh, ordinary Judaism just didn't have any biblical writings or biblical traditions as yeah. late as about 400 BC, which totally kicks to the curb um, documentary hypothesis and all of the whole notion of the Hebrew Bible as this ancient Near Eastern collection of, uh, of texts. Um, so what, you know, in terms of actual evidence, when do we actually know that, like, the books of Moses existed? Yeah. Well, the very first evidence um, is the Septuagint translation of about 270 BC, when it was translated from Hebrew uh, to Greek. So we know there was a Hebrew books of Moses then, because um, historical records or whatever say it was translated into Greek around 270. But it could have been written any time before 270. We don't know it was written, you know, 450 or 950 BC. There's no evidence of that. The evidence begins in 270 BC, the hard evidence. Now that means that uh, you're talking 50 years after Alexander the Great conquered the Near East, well, clear to India, and uh, 50 years of Hellenization, and uh, when Greek culture invaded that region of the globe, which means that you could have uh, Greek influences uh, on the Hebrew Bible. And uh, in fact, a gentleman named uh, Niels Peter Lemke from the University of Copenhagen, he wrote uh, a groundbreaking article in 1993, the Old Testament, an Old Test, an, a Hellenistic book, question mark, that proposed for the first time, maybe it was written as late as Hellenistic era, and maybe it's got a lot of Greek material in it. So that's the significance of the Elephantine papyri. It's really the smoking gun. It's the contemporary evidence that people should rely on and not these high in the sky, ivory tower, speculative, scholarly constructs. Yeah. It's real evidence. Yeah. Well, I was very tempted. I was very, hold on, Scott, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So I was so very tempted to actually start to shift the conversation over into uh, the, the, the other gods in the room, right, besides the elephant. Um, and 
<clears throat> switch it over there. But then you had said that there's these scholarly pie in the sky. So I want to I want to really know what that pie in the sky thing is. And and Scott, do you want to say what you're going to say? Maybe we can throw a yeah. few things at Russell that he can navigate. What's, what's the earliest source that we have for the mania for monotheism in, in, Ju in Judaism? Good you have, question. You have Yahweh's text and you have the priestly text and the JEPD theory. Uh -huh. But I want to know when, if, so if polytheism was acceptable and, um, right. and the basis for monotheism could have been nothing but local preference or local cult norm, when did this super hardcore monotheistic jealousy based where Yahweh is like, they don't even exist. When did that pop up and, and who popped it up? Sure. Well, all those sources, J E D P H um, D. Yeah. And, um, you know, the Pentateuch, um, Exodus through Josh, uh, through Joshua, they are not monotheistic. They are, uh, they advocate monolatry, means, which means you worship only Yahweh. The other gods exist, but it's just, you know, if you They're, worship... That's their gods. This is our god. This is our gods. And, um, you know, if you worship any of those abominable gods in our ter territory, then we'll kill you. Or even if you're living in the land and worshiping those gods, we'll invade and kill you. So. It's a it's a monopoly of uh, you know worship of God, so that's that's monolatry, and all scholars recognize that uh, Hebrew Bible almost exclusively deals with monolatry and uh, insulting the other gods, but acknowledges that other gods exist. The first uh, truly monotheistic portion in the Hebrew Bible, actually the only monotheistic, is uh, in Second Isaiah, where there are some claims that the other gods are, you know, they're false, they don't even exist. But that's, you know, that's later than the rest of the Hebrew Bible. It's a late addition, in my opinion. Uh, what about the, uh, the Ain Oat? There's no other if in the, in the Ten Commandments. Is that not is that a, in existence? No other. Uh, you you shall worship no other gods before me, in my presence, because I'm a jealous God. I'm mm -hmm. jealous of them. For instance, uh, the Exodus that just happened, um, and that it was said that uh, you know mm -hmm. Yahweh warred against the other gods and defeated the Egyptian gods. Uh, Chemosh, who was the uh, Moabite god, he's mentioned in uh, in Numbers as existing, but um, he was defeated. Well, and sometimes Chemosh beats Yahweh, in the, at least in one example. Uh, of, yeah, of, yeah. You know. It, it kind of depends on if um, God is on the side of the Israelites at that particular moment, if they're being sufficiently pious. Because, uh, you know, they'll he uh, he punishes lawbreakers, yeah. and uh, and it's it's really interesting in my in my latest book, which we'll get to. Uh, I show that Genesis uh, is, has polytheism, but all the gods are good. There's hmm. Nobody, no god gets insulted in the whole book. Um, but in Exodus through Joshua. Yahweh is the only good God, and ethics consist of only worshiping Yahweh. That's a new development. Uh, but, so anyway, the first evidence of monotheism, in my opinion, cosmic monotheism, uh, I would say was introduced in Genesis 1. And uh, we'll get to that when we talk about my latest book, um, because the Greeks had it, had ideas about monotheism that got introduced um, by, through Plato and into Genesis. And uh, that's a really interesting story. We'll you know, to, this like, does seem like a good time to segue into your books because all three of your books are really kind of mind-blowing in the, the arguments that they make. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Not to um, jump my, my first book was uh, written in 2006. 
and it's, uh, I'll give you the short title. It's called uh, um, Process and Genesis, Manetho and Exodus. Um, and basically in that book, um, I established that the Septuagint was the first evidence of, um, of the Pentateuch. And that the Pentateuch was using uh, this uh, Babylonian author named Barosus. He was a priest in the Temple of Marduk around 280 BC. And uh, that that was heavily used in Genesis 1 through 11. So that shows that uh, you know, the Pentateuch was written after 280. Um, I also argue that uh, Hecateus of Abderus was another Greek source. He wrote about 315 to 320 BC. Um, Manetho was used in the Exodus story. He, he wrote about 285 BC. So I kept on identifying all these various um, sources you know, Egyptian, Babylonian, whatever, but they all wrote in Greek. Um, and all of these texts were found in, in one location that was available to the Jews, the Great Library of Alexandria. Um, and some of the data that dates um, the Pentateuch, for instance, the geographical data in the Table of Nations in Genesis 10, um, there's three divisions. There's Shem, Ham, and uh, Japheth. Uh, Shem corresponds very closely to the territories of the Seleucid Empire around 273 BC. Um, people can't figure out why is Lydia, Lud, why is that a son of Shem? Well, the Lydians were part of the Seleucid Empire even though they were way off in Asia Minor. Um, the uh, Ham it corresponds very closely to the Ptolemaic Empire, and Japheth is all the ones that are outside of both ranges, like uh, around, around the Black Sea and this and that. But some of the geographical um, areas, regions listed in the Table of Nations, such as those up and down the Red Sea, they were only, uh, discovered in the 270s BC in uh, expeditions that the Ptolemies set out. And uh, some of those names were probably only known in Egypt. So all of this points to these Greek sources being found at the uh, Great Library of Alexandria uh, and written or dating it as, as late as like 273 BC or 272 BC, which is almost exactly when the Septuagint translation was. You can date that to 273 to 269 BC. So there are two events that are practically identical. One of them is Jewish authors are reading Greek texts like Barosus, Manetho, and others, to write the Pentateuch in Hebrew. And then the other one is um, Jewish or Samaritan translators who know Hebrew and Greek translate those same books into Greek for the Great Library of Alexandria. All of this happens at Alexandria. It's all scholars, Jewish, Samaritan, who know both Greek and Hebrew. And anyway, so my first book concluded, this is the same people. They wrote the books of Moses in Hebrew at Alexandria using uh, research that they did there in different historical sources. And then they immediately translated into Greek. So it was the books of Moses were written in a, in a Hebrew and Greek edition, uh, like like other famous uh, law collections back in, in the day, uh, you know. So um, that that was the conclusion of that book. That was process and genesis. Yeah, and again, this is mind shaking, game changing stuff. That you're not just saying, oh, we know, we know, we have a rule established that the Septuagint was written 
at that time, 273, I want to say, 270. Uh -huh. um, and But to say that the Hebrew versions, the originals, were also created at that same time. Yeah. It's just is such a um, yeah. game changer. And you point out, too, that we don't have any older texts of these, of the Jewish, the Hebrew Bible before this time. No, uh, we don't. Yeah. Uh, that translation is, is really the very first evidence. Yeah. Do we have any idea what kind of Greek texts these writers were using to compile the Torah? Yeah, there was, uh, like I said, there was the uh, Babyloniaca of Barosis, or as History of Babylon. There was the uh, Egyptiaica of Hecateus of Abdera, his History of Egypt, that he wrote for the Ptolemies to help them rule. Uh, there was another Egyptiaca. Uh, by Manetho, who was uh, an Egyptian priest. Um, so he had his own history of Egypt, um, you know, with all the king lists and whatever. Yeah, and then there's some more obscure sources that uh, a lot of people haven't heard of. So we can identify specific books, uh, dated books, and that gives that, that crunches down the chronological possibilities. Um, Okay, here's a really good question. How how creative were uh, writers of that kind, I guess, scribes or translator scribes, how creative were they allowed to be? Because I know in different co in countries, creativity is uh, sometimes is actually, um, it's actually championed. Uh, and mm -hmm. in fact, you're expected to be creative and then attributed to some great person in the past because that's what, that's what humility means. And then for the West today, after the 17th century Germans, we, we think that doing that is the most horrifying thing, destroying the purity of the text. So. So were these people taking large portions and faithfully translating them over, or were they being picky and choosy and maybe bending things along the way also? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, they, they adapted the material to their own purposes, um, and they blended lots of sources. I mean, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you have, uh, you know, the Sumerian king list, which has 10 long-lived kings before the flood. Uh, you have the Gilgamesh flood story, which very closely resembles uh, that in the Bible. You have uh, Hesiod uh, with his story of the Golden Age uh, that's very close to the Garden of Eden. Um, and you have Plato and you have all sorts of authors that are jumbled together. Um, that's the direct, there's a, there's, there's, uh, people who were directing this literary activity. Mm. And the story writers, they were flunkies. They were working for uh, the ruling class. Yeah. And uh, actually, that's a good segue to my next book. Uh, <laughs> unless you have a question there. No, he's the, he's the guest that runs himself, Russell. Well, this is fantastic. <laughs> Russell, I have a little segue question yeah. for you about the Greeks. Yeah. It's something I don't know who to ask about, about this. Um, I get frustrated and read a lot of Plato. I try, I, you know, I, I consider myself a, a layman philosopher and um, I do, I keep coming back to Plato. Um, I'd really, I'd really like to learn ancient Greek. Um, but I'm wondering how much of the Greek has actually changed. If you were to look up Greek sources, say in, for example, Perseus, Right. As, as you know, that's where I would go. I don't know where you would go, but I would I would go there and you'd see the Greek words there. And then I, the, I'd I, like to go to Perseus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good vacation. Yeah. But the, the there's this idea of the, the words coming together in Greek. How um, how much is that like what actually shows up on the original documents? or the, not the original documents, the transcribed documents, like how original is that source? Even if it is in Greek, mm. like mm. what is, is there added words or, um, cause when I look at, in, when I look at interpretations, right. Um, I see sometimes great flourishes and great structural changes. Uh, and I'm wondering like how, how much of Greece or Greek are we capturing? Mm. That's what I'm curious about. Well, there were all sorts of uh, dialects of Greek. You know, there were lots of regional variations. And Greek scholars actually specialized in 
kind of identifying the different vocabularies uh, that they knew about. Uh, spellings were different, um, you know, so there was a lot of variability there. Um, also, until really until the rise of textual criticism at Alexandria, at the Alexandrian Museum in the 270s BC, um, people had great freedom in changing uh, Greek texts as much as they want. Uh, uh, in fact, one of the reasons why textual criticism arose is there were so many different versions of Homer, just mm -hmm. all over the place, you know, 20 or 50 or who knows. Any bookseller who wanted to make a copy, uh, he could leave out portions, he could add for it, it didn't matter. So at the Great Library of Alexandria, which was the uh, center of scholarship, really, in the world at that time. It, it eclipsed Athens, it eclipsed everywhere. Um, they invented textual criticism so they could compare all these manuscripts and recover what the original text of Homer was. Um, and it took, it was, they had 70 scholars working on it. That's according to one report. Um, and there were different versions over the course of a century because they keep on working on this problem and other texts as well. So at Alexandria, they introduced the idea of an authoritative, you know, exemplar text. This is the version. Um, as an anecdote, um, late in the third century, um, the Great Library of Alexandria, they wanted some copies of, I think the plays of Aeschylus, no, Euripides, one of those. Mm -hmm. They wanted an authoritative version. So they, they made a request to the Athenians for a copy. And uh, the, the Athenians said, no, absolutely not. They're <laughs> a national treasure. <laughs> and the Athenian and the Alexandrian said, well, what if we, deposited 200 talents of gold as a oh, deposit. Shit. And I said, okay, under those conditions, I get, <laughs> <laughs> I get these autographed copies mm. written by the playwright at Alexandria. And uh, then they said, well, keep the 200 talents. We're keeping the original. <laughs> oh. um, they, they, so there were new standards, um, but until then, uh, manuscripts were pretty flexible. That's and, a beautiful uh, story. That's a beautiful yeah. story. What, what are you talking? Tell us about your second book. That's let's, let's hear about that. <laughs> the second one is uh, Plato and the Creation of the Hebrew Bible, and I wrote that in 2017. Well, it took me about uh, six or seven years. Um, a gentleman named Philippe Waddenboom wrote a book called uh, The Argonauts of the Desert. That's a weird title, but he collected together as many parallels between mm. uh, the books of Genesis through Kings and Greek literature as he could. And he published them all in one book. And uh, there were a lot of legal parallels uh, between Mosaic Law and uh, the books of Moses. Um, you mean the books of Plato? Yeah, um, the Plato's Laws, which is mm. his final dialogue, and the Pentateuch Law, the the Laws of Moses. Lots of correspondences. These had been noted. Um, you know, I think it was uh, yeah, Eusebius cataloged a bunch back in three hundred and something A.D. So it's been well known that the that Plato and Moses were very similar. Um, so he wrote that, and I was very intrigued, and I said, I've got to check into this. So I started out on this book, which cataloged all of the laws of the ancient Near East, all of the laws of Greece, and all the biblical laws, and compared which was closer, the Greek or the Middle Eastern. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there are a few ancient Near Eastern laws, Hammurabi, this and that. Is that a cat or a dog? 
I saw no the cats in the background. David. A cat and a dog. In there. Yeah, cats and a dog. I've got to let my dog out real fast because she's being really appealed right now. Oh, third. Oh, okay. I'll no, we we'll wait till it gets back for me to continue my answer. I don't think so. No, no, I'm here. I'm still here. Okay. It's fine. We're fine. Um. So yeah, there's there's a handful. There's a scattering of ancient Near Eastern laws, but there's a lot of parallels with Greek laws and the laws of Moses, especially Athenian law, and especially um, from Plato's laws, which was a theoretical book on how to write a constitution and laws and institutions for a new nation. And and this even includes dividing it into 12 tribes or units, yeah. Is it, right? Yeah. 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 That's, uh, there's a lot of constitutional features are the same, as, as, including the 12 tribes, um, which you don't find anywhere in the ancient Near East. Uh, it's not an archaeology, um, you know, of, of Israel, quote unquote, uh, or anywhere. But it's very common in the Greek world because they would divide up a nation into 12 tribes. Plato said that was ideal. So that every month they could rotate the duties from one tribe mm -hmm. to the next. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, a number of constitutional features, which is already interesting uh, that the laws of Moses have a lot of constitutional material uh, in them. Um, because constitutions were unknown in the entirety of the ancient Near East. There is zero. <laughs> constitutional content, but it's all over in the Greek world because um, mm. they ruled themselves. They had to know their own rules of government, so they would write constitutions. Every new colony, they had their own constitution. Um, so that itself is a pointer that this was in the Hellenistic era when the Jews and others had access to Greek literature and Greek constitution. So um, that's that was a lot of my book. Um, the last Quick question. Yeah. Before you jump on that last one, I remember you blowing my mind when you were talking about um, anachronisms in the David and Solomon stories to the extent that you said Solomon himself, the figure that we see in the Old Testament, seems to be based on on Shalmaneser the second, on Assyrian kings that the came three hundred years after the fact, did that yeah. come out in in the Plato book, or was that is that a different? Um, no, it's, it was Shalmaneser the third, but you know, mm. you were very close. No, ah. that came out in uh, um, in an article that I wrote for uh, Thomas Thompson uh, Festschrift. There were gotcha. a bunch of essays collected in his honor, and gotcha. it surprised him. And um, he he was involved in writing, you know, working on the history of that period, ancient history, uh, ancient Israel and Judah. So I yeah. thought that was an appropriate subject matter. Absolutely. And um, yeah, what a, yeah, what a gift! What a gift! You have right? some interesting. You have some interesting friends here. Let me give you a piece <laughs> of history. <laughs> yeah. that's 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 great. Yeah, I, I get to meet Thomas Thompson, uh, Niels Peter Lemke, and all sorts of other luminaries, uh, you know, Philip Davies, um, mm. at Copenhagen, at the University of Copenhagen. They invited me to a conference there, and uh, I thought it was 2011, 2013, I don't know, somewhere through there. So I get to meet all these great uh, uh, revolutionary um, Extraordinary jealous. The Copenhagen School has done more to overturn biblical studies than anything that's happening on this side of the Atlantic, for sure. Yeah. Well, a friend of mine was getting his PhD at the University of Copenhagen when I wrote Barosis and Genesis, uh, which I just wrote because, you know, for my own interest, because uh, I like research. And I sent it to him to read. Uh, he took the liberty of handing it to Thomas Thompson huh. to read. And Thompson said, we have to publish this book. <laughs> mm -hmm. So nice. uh, 
That's and I've never had to submit a book to a publisher since they'll, they'll publish anything, <laughs> right? Basically, um, that whole aspect of being a writer that, that was like poop solved. So, been an easy life from that aspect, <laughs> and well deserved. Well deserved, I have to say. Thank you. Um, so, anyway, the last chapter. Um, well, the second to the last chapter was interesting. It showed how uh, um, all, all throughout the Greek world, you have narratives, you have stories in which the presentation of their laws and constitutions was part of the story. Just like in the Exodus story and Moses as the lawgiver and it's tied into the story. Yeah. Um, and you don't have that anywhere in the ancient Near East. Either. But to get to the last chapter, that's where I point out Okay, not only has, um, is there so many, are there so many laws in the books of Moses that come from Plato's laws, but also the very idea of a sacred national literature comes from Plato's laws. Yeah. He, there, that's not found anywhere in the ancient Near East. It's not even found in the Greek world. Um, it was an idea that was uh, purely Plato's. Mm -hmm. He uh, he said that to found a nation or reestablish a nation, and for it to be successful and last through time, this is what you have to do. You have to make the citizenry believe that their laws are ancient. Mm -hmm. They had a divine origin. They came from a god, and they've never changed down through time. And if you can do that like uh, Crete, Sparta, and a few others, and your constitution will last, you know, forever, basically. Um, and so he said, any means possible, you have to sell the citizenry on this. Um, so you create a whole new set of laws, and you say, these were written a thousand years ago by, you know, some dude named Moses or whoever you want it to be. Yeah. Uh, well, the people you're giving these laws to, uh, they know better. They know you just wrote them. <laughs> um, but over so, time. Yeah. So Plato said, this is what you have to do. You have to create a national literature, mm -hmm. foundation stories. The most sacred is your, your law book. That's the most sacred book. But, but I have a question about what you said earlier. So, for, for example, I'm just, I'm just wondering. So. Yeah. Um, we have these uh, writers and um, they're, they're using external sources to come up with uh, like a national constitution and self image and self concept in a, in a, in a, in a beautified history. Now, for not, what I wanted to ask about was the 12 tribes thing. So I have two questions here. I hope I can separate them. So on one hand, I'm wondering who are the people that commission this were these priestly folks or were these independent mm -hmm. writers who just had good ideas or were they actually asked by the ruling class, give us a false history because I heard about this ideal, this Plato idea. So can you guys go out there and, and concoct something and then over time it'll seep in? Or, um, and, the, and the related question is, the 12 tribes thing, was this actually implemented? Did someone say, let's borrow this and implement it? Or was this entirely the whole time always just an ideal false history? There never really were 12 tribes operating in this nice way. It was something that they wrote down and then copyists preserved it. And it was never implemented actually socially. Yeah, I'd, I'd go with the latter. <laughs> um, well, in Athens, um, there was what they called the Cleisthenes reform, where they uh, reinvent, they redistributed uh, basically the uh, populations of Attica, or, you know, Athens. They, they broke it into 10 tribes. And um, each tribe was not only an ethnic group. In fact, it wasn't even an ethnic group. It was mm. an artificial ethnic group. But each tribe also had a geographical region near Athens, a territory. So uh, there were 10 phyla or 10 tribes uh, with their geographical bounds, just like in the book of Joshua. Um, and that was very useful for uh, military purposes, for conscription, 
and also for rotating duties and a lot of other things. So, Do we know when this was, Russell, that the Attica? Yeah, yeah, it was um, like 510 BC or something. Like I, I might have to be a few years off, but we know the exact date. Uh, it was a major, major uh, rewrite of the Athenian mm -hmm. constitution. So now all of a sudden you have 10 tribes of, of Athens. Uh, yeah. So, and each one of them all of a sudden had to have an ancestor. Right. Uh, they were eponymously named. So uh, they got a hundred candidates and then they took those hundred names and they went to the Oracle of Delphi <laughs> and had the God choose 10 out of a hundred. And then those were the mm. 10 tribes of Athens. And then um, a little bit later, like in the, the 300s BC, they bumped it up to 12. Uh, Plato said 12 was the ideal. Uh, most Greek uh, colonies had either six or 12. <clears throat> but uh, Was there yeah, a, yeah. a new numerological reason for the 12? That's because there were basically 12, 12 months in the year. 12, 12 moons. Well, and you'd mentioned earlier that that they rotated duties, right? right. Yeah. So, right. So would it be literally, you know, one month the yellow tribe and then the next month? Uh, yeah. The yeah, like uh, one duties. tribe would would run the uh, the national assembly and have other duties. And yeah, it would it would go month by month, so it wasn't too burdensome on any one group. So they created these artificial tribes. Um, when they went from 10 to 12, they had to change the boundaries. Uh, the, the census was different. Uh, and all of a sudden, you had two new tribes with a new ancestor who mm -hmm. were named after two generals at the time. Uh -huh. uh, so, um, yeah, I imagine something very similar happened with uh, the 12 tribes about the time that the books of Moses were written. One of them was Judah. You know, that was uh, an actual historical uh, kingdom. That one was real. Um, the tribe of Gad was real. We know that from the, um, the, Mo the Mesha Stelly from <coughs> Moab. The only problem there is Amatius like says that the tribe of Gad was uh, Moabite, uh, as far as people could remember. Mm. So it wasn't. It was never Israelite. <clears throat> so yeah, they were. They were invented. Um, so did I answer your questions I, I, pretty well, and Daniel? I, I do have something on that, and I wanted to to add something to Scott's question. Um, if they, if there's some degree of arbitrariness in the twelve tribes, when mm -hmm. the law comes down, I, I'm just imagining that a that a, a culture might feel this, right? A local tribe, they they say, oh well, the law has come down, and you know the guys over there, they're part of your group. You're like, ah, I don't want them to be part of my group, but they <laughs> are part of your group. So there's there's some organic forming of of tribes, but then there's divisions that have to be made because something has to be canonized right would that well, would that be an accurate way to look at it or would you, would you imagine it would be like that well i was going to say it seems like there's major portions of the old testament where that tension is happening and we see it on page like the whole story of ruth is to yeah. say hey the moabites they're not so bad um the people coming back from babylon and the people of the land you know that reintegrating those people who came from the exile to the people who always stayed there seems to be the the this point where this nation building really takes off would you say that's fair russell um yeah and i think that there was more um history or continuity or identification more on the clan level mm -hmm. uh smaller than a tribal level except for judah you know um which they were the old residents of the kingdom of Judah, and they became Judea, and Judah was one of the 12 tribes. And maybe the Levites, I don't know. But um, the other ones, um, they 
were basically erased in a way when uh, the Northern Kingdom was conquered. You know, in terms of their history, sure, there were 10 tribes uh, with the capital of Samaria, uh, but they were all deported uh, before our time, and so they no longer exist. They were kind of wiped out of existence. Uh, from the get-go, and some of some of the tribes, their territories in Joshua, they were never even Israelite or anything. So they they were kind of uh, they were like ghost <laughs> tribes, you know. They had a very tenuous existence, mm -hmm. uh, even even on paper, very tenuous. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, uh, all the different tribe lists uh, throughout the the Bible. Almost every one of them is different from the others. They have a different list. You know, yeah. Joseph maybe is a tribe, or maybe Ephraim and Manasseh separately, or this and that. They they were pretty sure there were either ten or twelve tribes, but other than that, there wasn't a lot of agreement. Yeah. So I got something to add to Scott's point. Uh, you know, about the interpretation and the point of interpretation, like the point in time when interpretation happened. Um. So. For example, there's a strong correlation between in the evidence between uh, the, the the laws from Plato, and then as it moves into uh, the Abrahamic, right? Yeah. So my my question is is that the um, when they're interpreting these are these are because you know who um, had the people actually do the trans the the uh, creating the text and it would have been the priestly class it would have been the people that were actually translating it and so what what i'm trying to think of you tell me if this makes sense is they 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 um translate the text but they they can't help but understand that their people are a certain way so if there's something that's completely on its face not compatible minor changes would uh, would start or major changes might start right at that interpretation from from the greek to the hebrew is that would that be fair to say um well we don't really know much about the reception of that first generation um we know that um you know the translation took place around 270 bc or a couple of years earlier uh, and then our historical references uh, to the Bible, to the Jews, to this and that. It's mostly towards 200 BC or later. Uh, so those first few decades are a gap in our record, and we, we don't really have much information, uh, which is interesting in itself. Because let me go back to the creation of this national literature. Um, he Plato said that, you know, there should be a foundation story, the laws, every, every genre of literature should be in um, that nat sacred national literature <clears throat> uh, and get rid of anything that's not sacred, uh, where the gods are behaving badly or this <laughs> and that. He had, he had some rules as to what's sacred and what isn't. And uh, so you have all this all, all these different literary texts in this national literature that is approved by a body of, they call them the legislators of the arts. That's what they call them today. Um, but they were basically censors. They, uh, they would approve certain books or reject them. They would approve parts of them or reject them. They would commission uh, poets writers um as a writer i know writers are at the bottom of everything <laughs> they're the lowest level of anything um, <laughs> was there a festive atmosphere around this was it like people were competing or, or just writing stuff people were making stuff up so what did the commoners think about this moment of great fabrication where they're like, oh, this is cute. I wonder if this will end up being like a new flag and people are going to think it's cute in the future. Or uh, yeah. or, 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 or did they perceive it as kind of like, you know, 
it's a survival advantage. Like all nations do this. Let's really get serious about our myth mm-hmm. and kind of brainwash ourselves because that's what it means to be a good citizen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, Deuteronomy says that uh, the laws are going to be uh, celebrated throughout the world, you know, um, that they're the best laws of any nation, which kind of shows that they were doing international legal research and also they intended to publish and that lots of people would know about it. Um, so they so they were pretty proud of it, but um, so they get these intellectuals, these educated elites to go to Alexandria. They were asked to create books of Moses uh, by King Ptolemy II, by the way. He wanted a copy of the laws of Moses for his library. So they obliged. They, they yeah. gave it to him. And um, and these educated elites, they wrote the laws of Moses. They wrote all of this creative history from you know, creation through the Exodus. Um, you know, and they had writers at their disposal, myth writers, poets, um, who, who did all this storytelling. And... Um, you know, and they came out with these these books of Moses, and then they came back to Jerusalem and Samaria and said, uh, "We now have the ancient laws of Moses and literature. You know, and uh, this is the ruling class. This is authorized by the Senate. So, um, so the people basically kind of had to accept it. Number one." And they were probably pretty proud because it was a prestigious thing to have your national laws and constitution in the great library of Alexandria. Sure. And another thing is we're, we keep talking about the Pentateuch, but we're not just talking about the Pentateuch. The story of David and Solomon and the whole story of those the, the kingdom, um, that was coming out at this time, too. So this this was a huge you know, national epic on the the same lines as what Virgil did with the Aeneid. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Th- the same kind of nation building in literature that we're that we're seeing. Yeah, uh, quite, quite true. The uh, yeah. with the qualification that uh, probably Genesis through Joshua, maybe Judges, were written at Alexandria. When they came back to Jerusalem, they started to write to finish the story. And there's uh, all of a sudden there's this Jerusalem perspective. Um, whereas the books of Moses, the uh, Samaria, the 10 tribes, they really had the dominant role. I mean, well, why were there even 12 tribes if this was written by the Jews? Mm. Uh, uh, the Samaritans, they had a dominant role in writing it. Uh, The book of Deuteronomy mentions Mount Gerizim, which is where their temple was, Uh, Shechem, Mount Ebal, all these Samaritan sites are very prominent. Jerusalem is not anywhere to be found. So you have Samaritans and Jews working together on the books of Moses. And by coincidence, the Samaritans only accepted the five books of the Torah. Mm. They didn't accept anything afterwards. Because when the project relocated to Jerusalem to complete the story, all of a sudden, uh, is what they call the Samaritan schism. The Samaritans became bad guys. Mm -hmm. Every king of Samaria was wicked. Uh, They were exiled. Uh, They went into captivity. Uh, Every last one of them, they disappeared. The uh, Babylonians that came in to replace them, they were a bunch of... uh, apostates and worshipers of Yahweh and name only and and they continue these horrible practices to this day. So mm. Jerusalem and uh, their priesthood or ruling class or whatever, they get to finish the, uh, the primary history, the later books and Genesis through Kings, as well as the prophets and you know the rest of the Hebrew Bible was created in Jerusalem and kind of wrote Samaria out of the story. Right. So there's 
some continuity and also some discontinuity. All um, this reminds me of that story about King Josiah and the high priest stumbling upon the this lost book of the law, which was Deuteronomy, we think, um, in the temple. Um, th I mean, that probably never happened, but the fact that they're creating a story about oh, look, we found this lost scroll yeah. of the law that's been lost this whole time until until right. today. The um, book of Deuteronomy written in the book of Kings, which sounds a lot like Deuteronomy and yeah. which people think were written by Deuteronomists, and it tells the story of the discovery of Deuteronomy. Yeah. Uh, Philip Davies said, uh, you know, this isn't history, this is ideology. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but also... Um, I have an article that's going to get published pretty shortly in the Journal of Higher Criticism that shows that uh, the righteous Josiah, he was not originally part of the story. And mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't really the laws of Deuteronomy that was originally discovered in uh, 2 Kings 22. It was the curses of Deuteronomy. Oh, uh, oh. Yeah, Deuteronomy, uh, Moses said, let's write down these laws, or let's write this book, store it up next to the ark, so that at some, in some later generation, uh, they'll read it, and it'll uh, condemn all of the uh, uh, disobedient people who are rebelling and who will go into captivity shortly thereafter. <laughs> well, that's what they discovered in Second Kings. <laughs> uh, the original version of Second uh, Kings uh, twenty-one through twenty-five, all of the kings were wicked. Everyone mm -hmm. from Manasseh mm -hmm. right to the end. Uh -huh. Same way in Jeremiah and a couple other places, and and this Josiah uh, discovering the laws and the nation repents and all of that. That was a later edition. And what happened? The nation repents and they still go into captivity. What's up with that? <laughs> well, and, and the double irony about that is all those wicked kings and those wicked dynasties, they were running the kingdom just fine for decades. And um, they're so demonized in the Bible, and yet they were totally successful. Whereas the Yahweh's, you know, poster boy Josiah he dies almost as soon as he's introduced yeah. in yeah. in the uh, in the story and we don't know if he was killed in battle by the Egyptians or if the Egyptians just execute him I mean it's yeah. so laconic yeah. we he just but he's gone as almost as soon as he shows up yeah. so and then his son uh, his reign has said he was as wicked as all of his uh, ancestors since Manasseh and his son yeah. as wicked as all of the ancestors since Manasseh, well, that includes Josiah, readers. <laughs> um, you know, there was a different version when that was first written. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and Kings doesn't say, oh, yeah, the whole nation repented, and then after Josiah, it went back into idolatry. Um, no, Silly just, Hebrews, constantly yeah. going back into idolatry. Ugh. Don't. Yeah, it's, it's like on automatic. You don't even have to mention it. So, um, okay. So you have this national literature with uh, where everything is compatible with the foundation story of the divine origin of the laws. Plato said, if this is the exclusive literature, if no one is allowed to read anything else, if foreigners are excluded so they cannot uh, give you anything other than your fake news or whatever, you, uh, you know, if you're isolated so that that's the only story that any of the people coming through the educational system, any of the children, anyone at the festival, anyone at any time ever hears, and Plato said, after one generation, people are mm. going to believe this stuff. Mm. Um, and in history, you know, you have 270 BC, and then a couple generations later, around 200 BC, all the Jews, uh, according to Josephus and other sources, yeah, they believed that foundation story. They believed the laws of Moses. They they bought it all because. 
uh, his that genius Plato, he knew how things worked, and uh, he erased the whole national memory. That's his image in the Republic to wipe it clean like a slate mm. and introduce a new national memory. And this is how you do it, and this is what uh, the Jews and Samaritans did, and it worked. Yeah. And yet all the footprints of the old way of life are still there in the Old Testament first to find, just kind of hidden in plain sight. You know, yeah. all the idolatry, all the, the foreign gods, all the different uh, religious sacred spaces, you know. Yeah. And, and to go, go back to something Scott brought up, um, play, in, in Republic, Plato said, well, through through Socrates, which was his, you know, anything Socrates say as saying is really Plato. <laughs> um, he talked about what they called the noble lie or the noble fiction, which is basically what Greek tragedy is, uh, serious plays. They were fictions set in their history. They they kind of roughly knew the characters or cast, and then they'd make up. Um, you know, Jason and Medea or this or that. They make stuff up and put it on and perform it. And um and that was all acceptable. It was a it was a it was noble, uplifting, it's what we would call historical fiction. So Plato said that, I, have a uh, I have a question to interrupt. Yeah. So would you would you put that in that same category, the Iliad and the Odyssey? Yeah. Okay. All right. That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. So Plato's idea of the noble lie is, uh, you know, is it okay to tell lies? Is it okay for rulers to tell lies to the people? And he said, you can tell, sometimes a lie is, uh, tells the truth better than the truth does. Uh, <laughs> if, if you tell a story that's set in the distant past, um, earlier than memory goes, you know, so people can't verify if it's true or it's false. Yeah. Um, it's in the distant past, and if the gods are portrayed as noble, and uh, the heroes are all noble, and uh, everything's ethical, then, uh, okay, technically it's a lie, but rulers are allowed to do that. They're allowed to make up the past, mm. uh, especially uh, origin stories. Uh, you know. Uh, the uh, there's, your there's your defense David, of, of Christianity, David. There's your Bingo. defense right there of Christianity. Bingo. Just they just need to come clean with it. We're allowed to lie. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're yeah, allowed Plato, to lie. Plato, Plato, said said that, <laughs> Plato said the rulers should lie. lie. Yeah. Is, is everyone yeah. here? Is everyone familiar with uh, Nietzsche's parable of the talents? I'm familiar with Nietzsche. Oh, good. Oh, this is this is the first Nietzsche story I heard. <laughs> So he, he's he's uh, explaining what truth is, and has it has it's just this quality of being an artifact, but through repetition and time comes to appear like a nugget of natural ore. So here, here here's a passage: What then is truth? A mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms. In short, a sum of human relations which have been enhanced, transposed, and embellished poetically and rhetorically, and which after long use seem firm canonical, and obligatory to a people. Truths are illusions about which one has forgotten that this is what they are. Metaphors which are worn out and without sensuous power. Coins which have lost their pictures and now matter only as metal, no longer as wow. coins. Wow, that's powerful stuff. Yeah, he was a great writer yeah. and very original thinker. Um, Lawrence Lampert, who he used to teach at, I think, the University of Indiana. Anyway, he's he's a kind of famous, I don't know, semi-famous Nietzsche uh, scholar. His uh, last book, he included a page and a half review of my Plato and creation of the Hebrew Bible. He was thrilled by it. He said it was amazing, and if you know, and it to as a Nietzsche scholar that it. Uh, Drew connections that Nietzsche would have loved. So mm. oh, um, that's great. Yeah. nice. So I had to go back and read a little Nietzsche to know what he was. 
Can we talk a little bit about Plato's Timaeus if we ha- yeah. if we haven't done our work around yet? How's the, how's the but we gotta ask poor Russell here. How's the voice? Because it's it seems to be holding up, but we don't want to <clears throat> push you. We can uh, you know well, exit it, gracefully uh, before you you know. No, no, no. Uh, it's it, it, it's holding in there. You can hear it's a little raspy. Yeah, um, yeah. and I'm having a little hot chocolate every once in a while to to soothe the vocal cords. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, we so would be. I was, I was just gonna say we, whole interviews with the totally broken voice. No, no <laughs> but that said, we would love to have you come on again because there's so much. I mean, it's just one question is like a hydra. It just you answer it, and three more pop up. You know, so yeah. Um, don't feel well, we have to solve it all tonight. If, if my voice holds up, okay. Um, and I'm supposed to keep my chin down to. Uh, supposed to help my voice yeah. um i'll tell you just a little bit i'll plug my latest book it's coming oh. out on may 3rd i think called plato's timaeus and the biblical creation accounts uh, cosmic monotheism and uh, terrestrial polytheism in the primordial history so the Basic thesis is that uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis use Timaeus and also Critias sequel quite extensively. Timaeus was Plato's book on cosmogony, on the um, origin of the universe. And he tells two creation stories basically. The first story had to do with uh, a really a mythical figure that he called the Dem- Demiurge or a craft or a craftsman who created this perfect cosmos uh, out of the chaotic matter that existed before then. And he used his divine goodness and rationality to order the world to uh, put the stars in the sky, and so on and so forth. Anyway, reads just like Genesis 1. A lot of the same events in the same order, uh, just remarkably similar. Then Timaeus goes into a second creation story, uh, because this perfect cosmic God, he was monotheistic because he lived in the eternal realm. He was the only uh being that existed in uh you could call it heaven if you wanted to it's the timeless eternal realm of perfection and goodness um well then there's a problem he is eternal everything he creates is eternal like the stars and the earth and and everything is perfect uh but uh what about life? It's mortal mm-hmm. and it's <clears throat> material, so there's the potential for wickedness. Well, he couldn't he couldn't have a uh, Plato couldn't have his eternal God creating mortal life. The whole problem of theodicy, you know, are the gods to be blamed for human wickedness? Mm-hmm. So um, Plato said, okay. The Demiurge, he didn't create mortal life. He planned to, but he delegated that to his sons and daughters, uh, the Greek gods. Hmm. Heaven, Oranos, Gay, the Earth, and all the rest of the gods. They were given the job of creating mortal life. Uh, And so these terrestrial polytheistic gods running around on Earth, they're the ones that created man and they ruled over different lands and so on and so forth. You get the same thing in Genesis, Genesis 2 through 3. Yahweh, he didn't create the universe. Mm-hmm. He's a dinky terrestrial God. He lives in Eden. He doesn't know what is going on half the time. <laughs> Adam, E, where are you? How come <laughs> I was naked? What, what was the problem? Abel, where uh, Cain, where's Abel? You know, he doesn't know what's going on. He's running, he, 
he rules over Eden. He lives later on. He always goes and uh, he has a lunch date with Abraham and Sarah. You know, he and his messengers, they're marching across the Negev desert and uh, show up at Abraham's tent. And he uh, has his wife cook up some lamb for him. You know, these are terrestrial gods. You have polytheism going on. Yeah. You have um, multiple gods. Genesis 6 talks about the sons of God who marry the daughters of uh, men because they're so good, beautiful, desirable. Uh, Genesis doesn't condemn that, by the way. Um, You know, later authors said, well, these are evil fallen angels. No, these were regular gods, you know, they were getting consorts, they were having offspring. The offspring were uh, men of fame and reputation, according to Genesis. I think it's 6 verse 4. So you have the monotheistic cosmic god. This is the first time, Scott, that you have a real monotheistic deity, even if he's only monotheistic at the time of the creation of the universe. And then Plato said he retired after that and let the other one take over. Rather like the seventh day, the god of creation retires. Um, And then you have the uh, terrestrial gods. Uh, Deuteronomy says there were 70 of them one over every nation, and you have 70 nations in Genesis 10. And there's a few references to uh, the gods, plural, in Genesis. Um, So they're running around on Earth, uh, and you have polytheism going on. And Genesis doesn't condemn any of them. You know, they're all terrific. so you're saying that there's a, a, a parallel between the, the two creations of Timaeus and the two creation stories in Genesis? Yes. Yeah. I mean, um, you, under you, the documentary hypothesis, these were different authors writing centuries apart. Um, no, they, this is a, a contemporary authors. They were in community. They were all relying on Timaeus. Um, and they were all writing in 270 BC. And what's interesting, Something else that's interesting is Septuagint scholars have long recognized that the people who translated Genesis 1, uh, they knew Timaeus. They used Timaeus. Some of the phrasing comes right out of Timaeus. Mm -hmm. So I've got this really a smoking gun that the authors were also involved in the translation, Mm -hmm. which uh, confirms my scenario from previous books. I don't know if this adds to that or if it's just an interesting coincidence, but in the New Testament, you've got a character introduced, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. Um, so that that seems unusually apt, you know, even for the, the Gospels, which are full of apt character names. Um, yeah. It'd be yeah. weird to me that there wasn't some connection there. With Timaeus. I don't know what the connection is, but uh, okay. yeah, that's, that's certainly a synchronicity, if nothing else. But yeah, yeah there might be some. And, and certainly uh, the opening of the Gospel of John, uh, although it uses the name Logos for yeah. this uh, creator who worked under God, basically. Uh, yeah. But that all ultimately goes back to Plato's Timaeus. Are, are, you maybe, to suggest, are you the first person to suggest? Are you the first person to suggest this uh, connection between Timaeus and, and the two creations in Genesis? Yes, I can't believe it. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's I'm incredible. The first like, one. Well, this is going to make you famous. This is this is this is the gateway. <laughs> amazing! Congratulations! That's really amazing. Yeah. yeah, and I'm also the first biblical scholar in the history of biblical scholars who have said that Genesis one is a cosmic. Mm-hmm. deity and Yahweh is a terrestrial deity. Mm-hmm. Um, although in Exodus through Joshua, um, these are no longer the philosophers in charge of the writing process. 
Mm. These are um, people associated with the Temple of Yahweh and national leaders, and uh, they did not want to share anything with the cosmic God. You know, they wanted Yahweh to be to have a monopoly. Yeah. Uh, Plato said, you know, the gods are not jealous. Uh, you don't get that in Exodus 20. You do not. Uh, oh, this, is similar, this is similar to the Gnostic account in a way, right. isn't it? Right. You, have, you, have, you have Sophia making a universe the proper way, and then she, she gives dominion over to these adolescent jerks like Yahweh who are, who are permitted to screw yeah. things up in their evil yeah. archons. So it's kind of like yeah. perfect God and then theodicy explaining shit God. And so uh, Yahweh serves this function. He, he really is, according to your account, if, if time may is with the template, then Yahweh was supposed to be a screw up a little bit. <laughs> well, he's cer certainly limited. Uh, the Gnostics, they started with Timaeus and Plato. Um, but Plato said that the material world was chaotic. So there was a strong potential for evil because Goodness is orderly, rational, regular, like the even motion of the stars through the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, material realm is atoms knocking into each other. Uh, and so it's subject to potentially chaotic and wicked forces. Um, but that isn't the creator's fault. He did his best. He tried to persuade the material realm mm. towards goodness and rationality. But, um, you know, not everyone can be persuaded. So the Gnostics, though, they um, said there's the eternal realm, which is good, and the whole material realm is evil. And therefore, the creators of the material realm must also be evil. The Archons, or, uh, you know, Marcion said it was uh, Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, so the Gnostics, they, they, they emphasize the uh, wickedness of the material realm more so than Plato. I see. So in, in, in the non-Gnostic case, the evil isn't the intention of a creator. The evil is just built into the stuff that the matter that's being molded. Mm. Yeah, 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 and and uh, you know, if Plato said there were three elements to the soul, one of them is the divine element, and then there's the appetites, uh, and then there's the impulses, and the rationality, the divine part, is supposed to rule over the others and domesticate them. But if it's unsuccessful, then those horses run wild and <laughs> who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a struggle and only the philosophers are really good at, uh, at getting their appetites and impulses uh, in order and, and domesticated. Um, so that's a, a little bit different view than, than the Gnostics. It's, yeah. And... Plato also had um, an ethics of the divine realm. Anything in the divine realm was good. And that included all the gods. All the gods were good. Uh, they all got along together. Um, nothing evil was divine. And there was nothing evil in the divine realm. Um, but starting with Exodus through Joshua, uh, they violated that platonic divine ethics. They said, yeah, you can be a god and, and evil. 69 out of 70 of the gods are bad. There's only <laughs> one good god, and the other ones are all wicked. And then later on in the period between the Hebrew Bible and, say, the Christian period, you had... Uh, Demons, you had watchers, fallen angels, Satan got prominent. Uh, so you had these, like Paul says, you know, there's wicked principalities ruling the world. Uh, and, and there's a battle between good and evil in the divine realm. Right. And, um, not, not in Plato. 
Because mm-hmm. Plato, all the gods were good. And he was insistent that the literature should reflect that. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, he said there's a chance that, you know, we can try this, but uh, it might get away from us when we found a nation. And it's a roll of the dice. And in in the case of uh, the books of Moses, you know, some of the authors did not subscribe to Plato's full set of ethics. Hey, Russell, I've, I've, said, I've said that myself. I just, I do. I say that his, his philosophy has this impregnated ethic to it because of the goodness. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear you explain it in such yeah. a way. Um, could you explain the, uh, the uh, Syracuse and Plato's uh, time in Syracuse prior to the laws? Right, laws were probably... Probably later. Well, they made. were the last dialogue. Yeah, so... How is this, how is experience? How would you describe his experience and failure in Syracuse, uh, in terms of trying to put some sort of applied philosophy in place? Yeah, he um, Plato and the members of the academy they were often consulted by other nations in writing their constitutions and in nation building, and in Syracuse. Uh, there were a couple of figures. One of them was Dion, I think, and the other one was Dionysus, or I don't know, something. They were kind of on two sides of the revolution. <clears throat> and uh, one of them was a big fan of Plato. And Plato went to Syracuse to help guide uh, his formation of a new government. Uh, but in his letters, um, he says that, you know, this guy was, he innovated stuff. He didn't really understand everything that I wrote. Um, and so that's why Syracuse was a failure. And ultimately, um, his, his government that he was trying to help put in place, it failed. Uh, he, I think, narrowly escaped arrest himself. and. Um, it was it was one example of a failed uh, platonic of attempt at nation building. Mm-hmm. Um, now, in the in the end of Plato's Laws, um, after he laid out the Constitution, national institutions, laws, everything, he said, "Okay, now we're ready to uh, put." the uh, ruling council into place, the nocturnal council, um, and get this theological government going. Uh, But at some point, we're going to have to trust that this first generation of rulers are thoroughly indoctrinated or educated in the principles of divine government and that they'll do the job right. Uh, They'll need to be trained, uh, conferences, um, sponsors, and, but he says, it's a roll of the dice. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you fail, it's, uh, it's going to make you famous. And you tried (laughs) to create this, uh, effectively a kingdom of God on earth Mm -hmm. with a divine uh, system of government. Um, But he says, you you can't guarantee in advance that it's going to work. It's it's a gamble. It's an old man's game, and maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. It's possible that uh, the, this close of Plato's Laws, where he says this, it might have been informed by his uh, experiences at Syracuse, where he tried to create a platonic government. And it did fail. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's great. I think we've uh, kept you for about an hour and a half. You've really, oh, yeah. you've really yeah, pushed yeah. the limit well, my there. Voice, my voice yeah. goes after about an hour, so oh. it, um, it's right on schedule. We're, we <laughs> miss you, Jesus. Right on schedule. We're Do you think giving you your only throat? <laughs> <laughs> 
do uh, do you think you'll join us next month? Uh, same time, same place, uh, similar uh, backdrops yeah, all around. Ryan, I'd like to uh, I'd like to have a, a sequel. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if there's fun. anything else to talk about, I don't know. It feels like we've <laughs> pretty much exhausted everything. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, no, um, I, I'd love to. It'd be great. Super. And okay. Scott, uh, Scott, I can tell he's already thinking of new questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, because I guess so. Ex- I was wondering, I mean, if, if when you collect your research information along the way, you have all these tumors of things that could expand in a new topic. And I was yeah. thinking about this great idea to distinguish the, the, the theodicy of intrinsic chaos and then talking about Marduk and Tiamat. And then I just started floating around with Joseph <laughs> Campbell and this fantasy land of this, you know, correspondences and parallels. Like everyone, everyone's a syncretist. Everyone's a universalist. Mm-hmm. We're like, we're like, like, I mean, the, the dream that there is a basic idea, maybe order, order versus chaos is the basic universal archetypal thing. And then, just, I mean, this, I, I don't know. It's not really relevant to what you're talking about. But my original interest in religion was based on the Joseph Campbell and Jung fantasy that there really mm-hmm. is something like a genetic information right. storehouse, and this stuff uh, percolates you, you up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what, yeah. what a what a comfortable. I, I mean, it's a very it's an enchanted idea that these guys are our deepest, like biological libidinal battery yeah. sources projecting projected outward exactly. in the second person and we can relate to them and learn things from them and all this it's, it's yeah. just a side hobby of mine but it's, it's a separate issue <laughs> <laughs> well it, it sounds like we can talk about it maybe next time super yeah okay guys all right thanks really appreciate getting together good night everybody thanks again good night all good night, all right. good night. The Myth of Jesus with David Fitzgerald.